I'm assuming we're already recording. If we're not already recording, Baz will scream. He hasn't screamed. <laughs> um, mate, cheers. Yeah, it's a coffee. Cheers. Have you got coffee? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, really? I'm a co- big coffee Jesus. drinker. It's almost gone. I better fill it up, haven't I? No, it's right. It's right. Yeah. Mate, Steve, Steve Thornton. Absolute pleasure. And only the second time you've met. It is, yeah. yeah it's a pleasure to be here. Thank yeah, you very much. Good, mate. I had a good chat with you at uh, the 353 Golf Day. Yep. Awesome. Good, good day. Yeah, it was a flipping good day and a good evening. Yes. And a good evening. Mate, remind me about the, 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 the anecdote you were telling me about painting camouflage nets in the Gulf War. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That's a long time ago now. <laughs> I, I didn't do any of that shit. Go on. Yeah, no, I'm supposed, I'm for sure that doesn't happen now. But uh, but when I was in the Gulf, obviously, uh, in the Army 1990, it was a long time ago, to be fair, um, 29 years ago. And um, joining up and joining the Army Air Corps uh, pretty much ended up um, in uh, Detmold, Four Edge Army Air Corps in Detmold. And pretty soon after getting to the unit, we... Uh, we announced that we're going to Op Granby, and um, so we started the pre- preparations for uh, Op Granby. And one of the preparations was painting the green cam, cam nets desert colour because naturally we didn't have any kit at all. And um, you know it's got to be the funniest thing in the world putting a massive cam net out in a hangar, and uh, you know and painting it all and right. uh, painting the tents as well and the 12b12s and so on and forth it's just just a mental mental the army's crazy sometimes isn't it? it is crazy. it is i mean not any bit of kit at all you know one uh, um one set of desi combats no boots you know you had to get a second set when you're out there so yeah, that was still happening years later i remember but, going to uh oh, yeah i remember when i went to um so the second gulf mate right so when i went <laughs> like, hell, how many years later was that oh, 13 know. years later right hey, look at that 13 years later a lot just changed and i went uh we were getting ready for iraq right and um i'm size 11 feet sorry we've only got it was like size eights and size nines or size six six sevens and eights and nines they had if you were like a size 10 11 or god forbid a size 12 you weren't getting any boots oh, and Jesus. i went in, in uh jungle boots Really? Yeah, jungle boots. Yeah, which they were right for it, but they, I mean, you know, just like fucking hell, craziness, absolute craziness. I mean, there's nothing like the Brits, is it, to not have the real equipment when you need it on time? I know, you know. Yeah. I know, mate. Yeah. So, when, um, how long? Would, so, when did you join up then? So, I I was uh, 21 when I joined the military. Both parents were in the military, and uh, and I didn't want to join up as a boy soldier, to be honest, as a 16 year old, and. Um, I really wanted to be a pilot when I was a young lad, but I'm colorblind, red and green, so I paid to that. So I ended up, uh, about February 1990, I decided that that was the time for me to, you know, start looking at going in. I was 20 at the time and um, went to the careers office in Slough, um, near where I lived. Yeah, I know Slough, yeah. God. And, so uh, Iraq, Iraq was an improvement then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and um, so I went to the careers office and I met an RSM there and he said to me, you know, you want to join the military? I said, yeah, I want to join the military. He says, oh, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I just want to travel the world, you know. I want to go to places. <coughs> and uh, he says, so what do you want to join? I said, I don't really know. So he gives me this brochure and um, and he says, uh, this is the Army Air Corps, you know. The brochure sold it to me, as they say. And... Um, and then it was the Army Air Corps, and it was, you can go to Belize, you can go to Berlin, you can go to Germany. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a, you know, a good idea. And they had the blueberry. I thought, that must be special forces or some sort. <laughs> 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 with a with squawking eagle on it. So I thought, yeah, that's for me. I mean, that was really as much as the, uh, um, he sold a, a, a core on me, so to speak. I didn't want to be infantry, and I didn't want to be tanks. So I didn't want to be navy or anything like that. So I thought, yeah, give it a go. I like helicopters. Why not? Mm. So I joined uh, the Army Air Corps and uh, went in about nineteen, uh, about April 1990. But it was funny because he said to me, he said, you, you know, not the average person can join the Army Air Corps. You've got to be a bit cleverer. And I said, oh, okay. So he said to me, we're going to do some of these tests. And I did these tests. And he said, uh, what's your hearing like? And I said, I don't wear, I don't wear an earring. He says, no, you're hearing. And I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, well, yeah, that's fine. Don't worry about that. So uh, obviously standard tests after that and, you know, got in pretty much within two months. Um, there wasn't right. a long wait, uh, to be fair, at that point. And I uh, went to Winchester, um, I think, 3rd, 4th of April that year. I remember it because that's when poll tax came in, in 1990. Council tax today. Uh, but in those days, it was called the poll tax. 
So I thought join the military and don't pay it. It was you know. For, when was the um, when was the Gulf invasion? You keep talking. Yeah, yeah. Gulf, keep uh, talking. I'm going to flick this light's flickering. Let's turn it down a minute. Sure. Oh. Um, I think it was August 1990 when yeah. when they invaded. Um, so it wasn't long after then. No, no, three or four months. So uh, August 1990 is when they invaded uh, Q8. And at that point, I'd already left um, basic training, and I was uh, on my way to Middle Wallop, yeah. and um, and did my uh, ten, twelve weeks or whatever it was there, and um, and it was certainly becoming serious with all the Americans definitely getting involved, and would the Brits get involved? Would they not? It was all conjecture at that point, and um, and by the time I'd completed, you know, yellow perils at um, Leckenfield, uh, my driver training and. Yellow perils. Yeah, they were the, these trucks that were called yellow perils. Is what they were called. What, like Arctic's or something? Arctic's, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, HCVs, yeah. yeah. Right. Everyone called them yellow perils in those days. Because the so, lunatics were behind the wheel. Say again, sorry. <laughs> because you lunatics were behind the wheel. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all these young lads, these nineteen-year-olds, are driving these big trucks through Hull and Beverly and that. Yeah, so, so yeah, so we did the training and then uh, went back uh, to Middle Wallet, wait for the posting. I asked to go to Germany because I always always wanted to go abroad. I didn't want to stay in the UK. I wanted to go abroad, and um, and I was uh, uh, obviously uh, I got through to Four Edge Army Air Corps, which was based in Detmold, and I think flew out eleventh of November. I think or eleventh of September. I can't remember the exact date. And um, and did the advance party pretty much straight away. And uh, I was in the Gulf. Uh, I think the twelfth of December, something like that. So it was. I wasn't even in my unit long, you know, as a sprog. Uh, pretty much straight out on the on the advance party. Mm. So uh, to be honest, I wanted to go. Wanted to do something. I think the Falklands was about eight years earlier than that. So there wasn't really much going on in in the interim. And I suppose when you join, you want to you want to do something, don't you? do your job, I suppose, that you could train for. So that's what I did. I went straight out. Mm. Uh, but I was a sprog, so I you know, didn't do what I was trained for. I was the one who was shimmying around, going to these bases there and going to that and picking up the mail and all that. And um, But it was good to be there. I was a bit good. Mm. Uh, um, when did you get out? Uh, 95. Just did the five years. Oh, okay, yeah. So I only ever <coughs> really went to one unit, which was um, uh, my unit in Detmold. And... Um, and I, to be honest, I loved the military. I thought it was excellent. You know, it uh, taught me a lot of lessons. You know, even though I was 21 and probably a bit more mature than a 16-year-old, I was a gobby sprog, no question. You know, I was taken aside and give me a good uh, um, talking to. There was no, you didn't, you didn't get a good kicking in those days, but uh, but I was given a good talking to, and it, t- it taught me a few lessons as well. You know, keep my mouth shut when I needed to, and um, and it gave me a lot of opportunities. You know, played football, did paragliding, did all the you know the winter and the summer pursuits that you all do when you go to Germany, just awesome, absolutely awesome. Yeah, really yeah. enjoyed it. It's um, it's a, uh, what was with the army air corps then? So this is there's a part of the there's like <clears throat> so your understanding of the military is a completely yeah. different mind in terms of switching between units because right. I often hear other cap badges, yeah. especially with the trades, they talk about like you were saying there switching between different units and you were saying you alluded to the fact you only stayed with the one, mm. which sounded like it was unusual for you, for yeah. the, for that. Unit, whereas like with me, power edge mm-hmm. or with um or with uh well infantry units, you just you that's where you stay. That's where you stay. You, right. you, you don't like I was always three power. Now granted, you know you got one, two, and three power the regular battalions. Right. And now you sort of switch between them more as the as you, as you go between ranks. But back when I was in, it was, didn't switch between them at all. And if you went outside the unit, it was to go and do a posting, and right. then you come back. So you go and do two years as a training instructor, for example you know, one of the depots or somewhere else and then you come back to the unit. Whereas for sort of the attached, uh, not the attached arms, so the trades, it tends to be you switch between regiments? Yeah, you could do. I mean, we were uh, four reg and at the time there was three reg in um, uh, Zost, I think it was. And then there was another regiment in Gutterslow and then you had a flight in uh, Bruggen and in Berlin. So you could do three or four years at a unit and then go to another one. Um, pretty quick. I would just be you going. It just you. Like a... No, no, no. Individual uh, postings. So you'd go to another unit from that. And um, but I think there was a lot of drawdown that happened after the Gulf War, and a lot of troops were leaving the military and so on. So within three or four years, Gutslow Army Echo was going, and then Zost was going. So I think people who were, you know, comfortable uh, in in Germany, at our regiment, and uh, and the fact that they were going to go back three or four years later, they wanted to. Take everyone 
uh, as a wanna in that regiment. I'm sure there were postings in between that, people who were promoted and corporals and sergeants and so on. But I either was fortunate or not fortunate, but I, I generally stayed in the same unit. Yeah, Inter- it's interesting. I suppose because the, the role of the units was, uh, so within within the, the, the individ- people's individual roles within units, you you were quite isolated to each other anyway, whereas mm. you like with infantry, for example, um, you work quite closely. So when I was, uh, you know, when I was a full school, I was with the same section, I was in the same platoon for that two years, yeah. and we were working together all day, every yeah. day, doing whatever we're doing. Whereas it's, di- it's different in the, it's different in the trade units. So, so keeping people together in their units for that cohesion isn't mm-hmm. really as important. You have to, and, 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 and it would not be good for the way they work. Anyway. I probably agree with that, especially if you go yeah. to combat, you want to, you know, learn and work with the right people yeah. all the time. I mean, we had um, basically two trades. We had uh, the ground crew and you had uh, signals and you're really one of those. And that was it. And um, didn't want to become a pilot, obviously, because of the, the color blindness stuff uh, would have been great. We had the links and the gazelle in those days. Obviously, when you went, it was all Apache. And um, are those links? And those gazelle? They still had them. The yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 I'm pretty yeah, sure they, they definitely yeah. had the links. Yeah. The, well, the links is a beast, isn't it? It the is. Links, it's not, the links not the fastest yeah. helicopter, fastest helicopter in the world. It was when I was in. It was definitely the fastest. I don't know whether that's I changed. I remember being told the same thing. Yeah, it could be. Then it could still be the fastest. I mean, it was a beast, you know, and uh, a real good bit of kit, to be fair. And uh, whereas the gazelle, you know, it's, uh, it's just a big glass bubble, isn't it? You know, and um, so it's uh, about a distinctive sound. You can hear a gazelle, especially in flying Salisbury on Dover Air. You know, a gazelle's coming when it's uh, three yeah, four miles away. I, I, don't know diff- I know the difference between a Chinook and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my ears on his attuned. The Chinook's a walker, walker, walker. And if he's making another noise, it's, is that a plane? Is that a helicopter? <laughs> it's not a Chinook. It's not that. Classic. Yeah, epic, mate. What was it like when you got out? Um, it was, um, what was the decision for leaving? Well, I was in, uh, I was married to a German. Um, so, um, you know, it was, I suppose it was handy for me that my unit was being posted back to the UK. And then I decided that I wanted to get out of the military. And, um, because they were letting people out in less than the 12 month period and the sign off, I could get out within six months at that point. So I'd done my leg in skiing, I believe, if I remember correctly. And, um, and thought the unit's going back, married to a German. I probably want to stay here. So um, I decided to get out and sign off and get out in Germany. Um, to be fair, really missed it. Missed the camaraderie, you know, the football, the sports, all the activities that you get. Because in Civvy Street, it was it was difficult enough as it is, but I was I was getting out and going on the German net. So it was uh, doubly difficult trying to uh, get a job, obviously. Uh, you German speaking, were you? Um, not enough to get a regular job, um, so I ended up, unfortunately, uh, being this, one of the guards on one of the gates in the interim. And um, that's no—I mean, people do that for a living these days. They do, hard, yeah. Right? I mean, it's mind them, to be fair. But uh, you know, I read a lot of books. I could tell you that, and I played a lot of golf because it allowed me to do uh, one day on, two days off. And um, and I ended up moving because she was from the Viersen area instead of the Detmold Senlager area. Um, we moved to Viersen, Munchengladbach. So I ended up staggering on the gate in uh, seven sigs and, and uh, 280 UK signal squadron in St. Tornus and Crayfold. And a uh, nice little squadron, you know, really quiet, quiet camp. It was great. Absolutely loved it. Mm. Um, but um, uh, I think um, I think over time it was it was obvious it just weren't going to work with a with wife, you know, difficult enough as it is marriages without putting a, you know, another language barrier and other, other things uh, within that. So, you know, we parted companies, but it was a... It was tough time. That was my lowest point of my uh, my life. Um, ended up in debt. Um, things didn't go my way, you know, for whatever reason. Um, you know, the courts don't look it on your side when you're a foreigner in a foreign country when it comes to things like that. So for me, it wasn't great. Um, and, uh, and ironically, at my lowest point is where normally everything changes when something happens. I had, um, I was playing golf with a guy and he asked me if I would help take a customer he was a ex squad he was running a car showroom in germany at the time in, in uh, hq and he said to me do you want me to would you want to give me a hand and uh, uh take a customer to calais i'll give you 300 deutsche marks in your hand and i thought she's 300 deutsche marks gonna last me forever that is because <laughs> i had no money at all and um so that was my introduction i guess to a, a totally uh a different outlook on life i was working really hard all my money was going to my ex-wife 
And um, and I needed to completely change that, change the way I was living, change the way I was doing it. And this gave me an opportunity to do something different and, uh, and really change my psyche, to be fair. I thought you were like 26, 27 at this point. I was, yeah, about that. I was yeah. about 27, I think, at that point. Because I spent a couple of years on the German net and... I worked at British Airways, Dusseldorf for British Airways. German net? Which mean? Um, so I did, I did have a job in the camp, um, which was one day on, two days off. And in my two days off, I also worked for security for British Airways. That was totally on the German net, paying German taxes and everything, in Dusseldorf. And, um, and that, that was great, to be honest. Loads of girls. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 Loads of stewardesses. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> so that, that was really cool. And, um, but I still kept contact with all my mates. You know, I played football on the, on the camp in JHQ, played golf with all the guys. So I still had that connection. And to be fair, I really wanted that, uh, because it was a lonely place if you didn't have, um, that, um, that camaraderie, uh, with, uh, yeah, I believe I've got in. a few mates who, <coughs> I've got a few mates who have gone into, in, sorry. I'm, I'm giving you microphone advice. I'm jacking on myself. Mm. Um, I've got a few mates going to MP, MPGS. And it's one of those, like you say, there's people who are going, there's people who have jobs and civvies as well. Mm. And I, I look at it and think, how oh, on earth? I could never do that. Yeah. Cause like you say, you describe it as mind numbing. And the yeah, MPGS is one side of that. But then on the flip side, I could see the total appeal mm. of that absolute routine. And you know exactly what's happening in months and months and months time yeah. and you know you're not going off at the same time every day or at the same time of that shift whatever you know whatever the rotation is and you can get back you know you can get to the gym you know you can you know go and play golf yeah. you know you can read your book watch your programs it's absolutely rigid and I, I reckon those people who like that must look back and think how can you do how can you do what you do yeah like you know for yourself yeah i mean go man your life's chaos Absolute chaos. You can't plan anything. It's like where's your routine? Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of it's pros and cons to both sides. You know. It was. I think the the thing for me is is that uh, although it was it was a means to an end at the time. That's all it was. It was a bit of cash in the hand, you know, and that, that's uh, that's what it was uh, needed for me. And uh, had the had the mates. And all my mates were uh, my Sevy mates. My German. They were English, but they were on the German net, <clears> and um, and they were they were brilliant at the time. They're looking after me, and, and you know take me out for meals and so on when I had absolutely nothing you know and so you you know you need to make to that that particular point but to stag on the gate constantly forever and I'm thinking that's just I need something different there was always a purpose in my life when I was a kid that I wanted to do something didn't know what it was I always wanted to run my own business never really knew how I would ever start one to be fair but um there was always something more to do and um and, uh, and opportunities obviously came up uh, a little bit later uh, uh, from that uh, from that scenario. Mm. Mm. You keep saying German net. Mm -hmm. Is that just a, is that just a nickname from back in the day for people living in Germany working? On, yeah, uh, paying money to the German government. Yeah, working for German it's like countries. a phrase. Yeah, if you got out of the military and you were um, working for the military in Germany, you'd be just working for the military in Germany. But the phrase that we used, if you were then paying German taxes, paying German insurances, we would just call it the German, German net. net. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that, mate. Um, so you met the guy, three hundred Deutsche Mark to take you to the to take the customer at the airport. He was working for a car sales. Yeah, company. He was working for a car sales company. Um, he knew that was a, a pretty low ebb, and um, he asked, offered me these three hundred Deutschmarks, which was about a hundred quid. And um, it was a uh, did I say uh, airport? I meant Calais. And um, so, um, so I thought, you know, three hours to Calais, three hours back, you know, cash in my hand. You know, I thought, well, that's easy. I don't have to give it to my wife, you know, ex-wife or whatever. So that was good. And when I got back, he said to me, "Listen, um, I need a I need a car salesman for the showroom in JHQ." And I said, I ain't going to be a car salesman. I said, no fucking way. You know, these guys, they rip people off. You know, I got ripped off when I bought a car when I came back from the Gulf War in uh, 1990. You know, cr crap APR rates, you know, didn't get a discount, nothing. And um, and I said, no, I'm not doing that. And he said, look, I promise you, it's not all like that. You might have had a bad experience. This is different. This is what we do. You've got no money. I'll, you know, there's no there's no basic. It's just commission. Um, but the commission's good, you know, and you know everyone in the camp because you play football and golf and you still have that connection. He said to me, I think you'll be brilliant. <coughs> and I thought, oh, I thought, no, what am I going to do? So I looked at it, you know, practically. I was, um, I'd had holidays at the time. I don't want to go on holiday, but I had, you know, a 30 days holiday to take. And I thought, right, I'll take a holiday from there and I'll go and work for there. And um, sold the car my first day. 
Thou- thousand Deutschmarks in Three. my hand. <laughs> thousand Deutschmarks. <laughs> a, a BMW 5 Series to a guy in seven six, And I was like that. Well, this is easy. I mean, what was all the fuss about? And um, and, it, and I looked at it. This guy had come in. He needed a car. He needed help. He needed sorting out. His other car had just broken down. And I, and it, to me, it just something twigged straight away that it was about helping someone. It wasn't about, you know, giving someone a pizza and you then you got the next customer. It just that guy needed help and I helped sort him out as best I could with the training that I had. So for me, it was like that, right, this is what I want to do. You know, I want to work hard. If I work hard, I'll get, I'll earn more because there's no, ba- you've got to work because you get no basic. And um, so he said, why don't you, you continue with that? And I said, look, let's see how the month goes and then I'll make a big decision after that. In my mind, I'd already made it to be fair. And, um, so sold the car the first day, thousand Deutschmarks on the end. Picture it now. Didn't sell a car for the next month. <laughs> <laughs> Not a single car. Yeah. Not a single car. So, but I'd had the bug, as I said, and already made that decision. And um, and JHQ was a was a, a location that was massive in Germany, but it was very poor for for the car sales company that I was working for all the time. And um, and they'd been let down by a few other people. And um, so it was really, you know, you come in set the showroom up, get the sofas, do this, do that. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. And I'm thinking, wow, he's empowering me to do stuff that, you know, I don't really know how, but at least it, it gave me a sense of worth um, instead of just being a guy staggering on the gate. And um, so I did the training and then I, and I continued to do uh, well for the for the showroom out there and started selling cars for a, another company, to be fair. And, um, and that totally changed my life. How gracious the people were who were in the trade, the genuine ones, certainly. Um, the big pay packet that the biggest one that I ever got when I when I had a, a three or four months later I took all my mates out all the wives out took them all out because they'd looked after me the previous three or four years and just said big thank you uh, for that so I learned, learned a few lessons at that point I have to say how did you doing that job right mm. I've done sales job in the past um, I found it subs- looking back I found it um, I found that the the constant rejection, almost yeah. constant rejection, yeah. difficult to deal with. I yeah. think, I, I, not difficult to deal with. So, <clears throat> well, you know, yeah. but people who are listening, maybe who haven't done like a sales job, yeah. Yeah. based and based only on commission. Again, it was yeah. just on commission. Yeah, man. And this job I was doing, and the idea was you'd hit. It was it was business to business, and you'd hit. Uh, you ideally would want to be hitting fifty to a hundred businesses a day with mm. the pitch. Um, you'd want to be oh, turning over. Th- Jesus. You'd want to be turning over out of that three sales a day. Mm-hmm. Man, that's, that's I had a similar experience. When yeah. I first started it. I had some massive sales, like ma- stri- straight off the bat, massive sales. But then as it, as it went on, you, you think even if you like say fifty to hundred businesses a day, and you're expecting to get three sales, yeah. that's anywhere between forty-seven and ninety-seven rejections. Yeah, rejections. No, no, no. 47 and 97 potentially times you're going why well, what did I do wrong but not co- not consciously but over time and I found it really ground me down it really affected my motivation yeah really affected my motivation it was I did that for I did that for months and months and months and months and months and in the end it's like fuck this just couldn't couldn't do it Sales is really sales is a difficult thing because, as you it say, is. it's you not everyone's going to buy, even if you've got a captured market and everything else like that. And um, and I hear people who are called callers and have to call, you know, minimum of this amount of people per day. You can't give someone your passion and your empathy to a hundred calls a day. It because after the fifth one, you sound robotic. And um, so that is a is a job that I would not do. And the reason why I think this is different for what we did is because everyone who was in Germany was entitled to buy a tax free car. So everyone you spoke to was potential. So our conversion ratios were probably a lot, lot higher than the rejection because we didn't have to make calls out. People walked in. So, I was going to say, yeah. So, See, I was going into businesses. I was yeah. on the phone. Oh, I was going yeah. into businesses. Right. So it's face to face. Oh, that's like, difficult. Yeah. yeah flipping neck. <laughs> oh my god yeah no you know you're right yeah i was gonna, I was gonna say the customer is coming into the business yeah you you sort of almost already in the upper hand yeah but this yeah yeah no yeah absolutely it was and and in those days as well slightly different which is why we did things later uh very differently is that um you bear, basically the, the the way that sales is you sell what's in stock you sell what's there 
um, you know, you get the customer and he gets happy, he drives away and he's, he's brilliant. So we had in those days stock cars on the ground in bases in Germany. So we'd, norm we'd normally get two or three guys in together and say, we all need a car. I mean, and I would make them fill out their own order forms while I was doing something else in the background so that they can drive their car away. It was that, I wouldn't say it was that easy because you have to go through certain procedures, but it was like they all came in together. I'll have the blue one, I'll have the black one, I'll have the red one. And then suddenly you get more stock cars and you sell them. So it's very, very different uh, to how things are done today. But in those days, that's how it was. And um, But as long as you gave them a good price and a discount and a good you know finance uh, package, then they were happy and they come back. And in those days, you probably don't know this as well, because obviously, because you're younger than me, but you were allowed to buy a tax-free car every six months. Oh. Yeah. So they would buy them and sell them on, I'm guessing? That's correct. So you get guys <laughs> coming in, buying a car, and then, um, and again, this is how easy the sales sort of were. So if a guy came in with a, um, let's say a Golf, uh, you know, um, GTI in those days, I guess it was, or GTD or whatever it was, and uh, he'd come in and he'd pay 17 grand tax-free and... Um, and then you wouldn't wait for six months before he come back and sold him a car. You'd say to him, right, I'll give you 18 grand for that car now in six months time. And I'll reorder you your new car now with an upgrade or give you some cash back in your hand. So he'd, he'd be like, he's got orders backed up all the time. And, um, and people were doing buying Alfa Romeo 156s or GTVs where there were 30 grand in the UK and they could buy them tax free for 14 and then they'd sell them oh for 20 God. grand or 21 grand in the UK. So everyone was making money on the cars. It wasn't a, a concession in those days that you can buy a car because you're a squaddy and save a little bit of money. No, squaddies didn't look at it that way. They looked at it as, how can I make money? <laughs> so it was all about, um, can they get the best car they can? And Mercs, if you were a, a higher ranker, you know, a sergeant or above, and you were really buying uh, BMWs and Mercs, and you were making eight, nine, ten, fifteen grand on those cars. A lot of money, a lot of money. That's quite lucrative. It was very lucrative, and it all ended like that. What happened? Well, there was two things that happened. Firstly, and uh, and in those days, you had what's called um, grey imports or parallel imports, where you could buy a car on the continent from a <coughs> dealer, a German dealer or French dealer or whatever, right-hand drive for about six or seven grand less. So the price of the car was already less to start with. And um, and then you take the tax off and then you'd save even more money and so on. And what happened is it caused a big problem in the UK in the car industry that everyone in the UK was buying cars abroad because consumers follow where the best prices are, generally. And um, so they had a massive realignment of pricing in the UK to bring the UK pricing down, which was a little bit more equivalent to the European pricing. And um, so that caught a lot of uh, dealers off at the time because we used to supply cars from German dealers uh, that were right on drive, right on spec and so on. And then the dealers got wise to it that a lot of cars were coming in and people were making a lot of money on it. And they didn't they don't like squaddies making more money than they would be making on a trade. So they then had started to have policies where they were not allowed to buy as a group imported cars. The car had to be UK supplied originally, exported, and then brought back afterwards. So that's that situation slowed down pretty much overnight just on the um, uh, the, the German supplied cars. People still buy them t six months old and swap them every six months and so on. And that lasted about another two years. Um, and we're, we're probably in about 2000, 2001, 2002 now. And that all, all changed overnight. And you weren't allowed to buy a tax-free car in Germany every six months. It had to be every 12 months. Uh -huh. Whereas in Holland, it was one per tour. In Italy, I think it was one per tour as well. And um, so there was a big change in the psyche, not just for squaddies, but for everyone in Europe who was buying cars. And their Range Rovers overseas, eight grand cheaper, nine grand cheaper. So it was a big, big change, to be fair. That's, uh, yeah, epic. So un unhappy people. Hmm. What, when did you, um, what was your next progression on from being a salesperson did you advance within the company um uh well i ran the showroom really there was i think eight showrooms for the company i was working for at the time uh, across germany so san lager and gutslo and jhq brug and a few others and um and i became the top salesman in the company um over those three-year period that i was there and um why is that? Why do you think? Why is, what, was, um, what was different? Yeah. I would say probably bad habits. So people who were doing it and were used to the old ways of doing things uh, really had a lot of bad habits. There was arrogance, a lot of arrogance in the car trade. Were they? Were those people you competed in within your business? Mm. Were they ex-military as well? Mm, 
two or three. Okay. Yeah, some of them were ex-military RAF guys that again stayed out and then they worked in the car trade and so on. And in, and in those days, I think um, you know um, I got to the the place where um, all the good times had ended effectively. And then so the sales guys that were making fortunes and also um, <coughs> um, and had bad habits doing it for ten, fifteen years at that point didn't like the new way of doing things cars that had to be supplied by the UK and so on and so forth. A bit, bit more regulations and um, so they all went by the wayside. So I was there. I think that's because I was hungry and I'd come from nothing. Everything was, was new for me. And um, so I was a quick learner uh, from that side. And um, uh, I think in 2000, I think it was about 2000, uh, I'd been there three years, three and a half years and uh, loved every minute of it. got a lot of friends, uh, learned a lot, I think, as a person. I was about 29 at the time. And I'd saved a lot of money up and um, wanted to come back to the UK, met someone new. And um, I decided to come back to the UK and um, do my own thing and uh, bought a house in uh, Lincolnshire. And um, I thought my ex my, my wife, uh, or rather my, my partner at the time, her parents lived in Scotland. My parents lived in Staines. Lincolnshire was the in-between. And um, I didn't really know how to set up a business or do anything. I always wanted to do something, but I didn't really know how to do it, to be fair. And um, my old boss in Germany had said to me, um, you know, what are you going to do when you go back to the UK? And I said, oh, I'm just going to work for a dealer. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. So he invited me out to Frankfurt. Um, for like, I've come over and have a barbecue and I'll have a chat. And um, we'd have a goodbye, you know, have a good night out. And um, when I got there, he basically said, look, I don't really want to, you know, uh, talk out of turn, but I've got an idea that I want to do and set up a business in the UK, but I've got no one that I want to do it with because, you know, there was a lot of mistrust in the car trade, especially all sales guys. And I said, well, I'd like to do something, but I don't know how, you know, how do you set up a business and how do you do all these things? So we got together and uh, decided that uh, it would be a good partnership if he gave me the knowledge from the top end down as a as a company owner and for me for the hard work that I was doing. So effectively, he'd be the inspiration, I'd be the perspiration, and we'd, uh, we'd set up this business. So in 2001, we set up um, uh, Forces Cars Direct in the UK, um, supplying cars that were UK supplied because that's what people wanted. Um saving more discounts instead of stocking cars in Germany and having them transported over there and so on. So we saved more money by discounting the car a lot, lot further. And uh, so well, Explain that to me. So if, if you're putting a car on the ground in Germany, obviously you've got a cost to, to purchase the vehicle, to ex to transport it from Germany, from the UK to Germany. Yeah. Because everyone wanted UK cars at that point. So there was a lot more cost involved. Everyone being just the squaddies. The squaddies, oh. yeah. So they they would buy cars in the UK, ship them out to Germany. That's correct. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, Why was that? Um, because they didn't want the, the the UK imports anymore. Or, uh, sorry, the the um, the parallel imports from Germany because after six months or a year, the dealers didn't want them. So they had to get proper product from the UK, from that side of things. So a slightly different product, different specifications, slightly. And then uh, if you bought a thirty thousand pound Mercedes and you couldn't sell it after a year, then you're stuck with it. So. Yeah. They had to go and get supply from the UK. So so we set up uh, Forces Cars Direct with just three brands, you know, Vauxhall, Ford and Honda to start with, and um, saved more costings from the operating costs of obviously uh, running showrooms in Germany and so on, and, um, and passed those savings on to the customer and allowing them to get an even cheaper car uh, from that side and negotiate better deals with the manufacturer. Because in those days, they didn't want to give any margin off. They wanted, didn't want to give anything off at all. So we had to, you know, work hard and fast and pioneer a new program that they were missing out on a business uh, of overseas, proper UK cars, and um, and offer a bigger discount uh, uh, to the customer. And and that was, it basically was, it went off straight away. It worked straight away. Uh, the concept was perfect. Um, the location didn't make a difference where we were based because all of our customers had their cars either transported to Germany or when they bring their old one back, they were dropping off and picking the new one up and driving back. So they did that in the same journey, effectively. Mm. So at, um, at the height of the market in probably 2000 to 2004, 2005, I think about 11,000, 12,000 cars sold every year just to Germany. From you? No, from uh, oh, sorry, sorry, from yeah. the, the entire market as an export yeah, customer. Okay. So it's a lot of that. We did about, 
I would say 15, 18% of the total market because there was all the old people who were doing it. Those are the naffies of these worlds and, and so on. And um, Naffy used to sell cars. Naffy used to sell cars no. in Germany. Yeah, 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 yeah. Naffy on the ground in Germany used to sell cars. Yeah, long, long time ago. They don't exist anymore. Um, from that side, it's all all binned. So yeah, so that's that's how we started in the business, and I had to had to learn pretty quick, you know, and um, and getting a building and renting it and understanding um, uh, all the commercial agreements and so on. So there was a big learning curve for the first three or four years. What was the biggest gap in knowledge? Would you say from the commercial side? Um, um, that, uh, from a, from, yeah, go on. So when when I started, obviously I could sell on the phone, that, do the paperwork, all of that was dead easy. Then doing the invoicing doing the marketing strategy and designing adverts uh, to then put in magazines and so on. That I didn't know anything about. So we had to outsource some of those to local design agencies. Um, so then managing those projects was, and bear in mind I was all on my own as well at this point, because my, my, you know, my business partner was in Germany effectively. And um, so they, those were very, very difficult. And when we met with manufacturers, we did it together so I could learn the, you know the pattern, so to speak, and uh, and understand it. What made it really good for us is that, um, as a successful business, I think is because I'd been through it as a squaddy. I'd been ripped off, uh, uh, so I understood what the consumer was actually looking for. I understood his uniqueness about not always being on the phone, he's on exercise, he's doing something, and we were giving a service to them that they really, really needed, and um, so that was. That was good from our perspective. It wasn't easy, but it was still good because, as you know, on the phone you can put the phone down quickly if you don't want, you don't like the answer you get. So um, I, th I guess the biggest challenge was um, the part exchanges in, in reality because you can't see them. Whereas if you're in a showroom, you can see the car and the damage and everything on it. Whereas if you've got a guy on the phone and he says, "What's your car like?" Oh, it's perfect. No, no dents at all. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get around that? Yeah. How does that work? Well, um, at all, we, we obviously do it all by paperwork, so they have to confirm that the damage is, there isn't any damage on the car, but we've had some real serious, <laughs> nasty cars Can't turn imagine. up. Yeah, and once you've registered a new car tax-free, the car's got to go out of the country within 60 days or 30 days. And um, so if the customer's turned up with a real bag of nails, you know, and it could be three or four grand's worth of damage on that car, well, he's contact his new car until he's paid for it so we always worked the problem and you know whatever the situation is whether there was a ferry strike or there was a customer had to go to afghan or whatever it is and um, we, we changed that uh, that whole psyche because when we set up the business in 2001 september 11 happened later on that year so we had a very very good steady growth of business and then suddenly it was a you know, no one knows what's going on, and um, and then things obviously uh, changed quite a lot. So it was a it was a difficult period, you know, with with environments that we couldn't control. So, have, have your customer base always been predominantly um, military? Then, um, yeah, we uh, we started off with, um, and it's changed today, but we started off with just selling tax free cars. So, if you're a squaddy overseas, uh, France, Belgium, Germany, Holland, wherever, you can buy a tax free car. And um, but you have to take the car to the country of destination of where you are. So if you're based in Germany, you can take a car and you're ineligible. You can't have one if you're you can't have one tax free if you're in Afghanistan or Iraq because you can't take the car with you. Um, so um, you've got to be able to export the car uh, from the UK temporarily, register it on the BFG net, the British Forces Germany net, and then bring it back a year later, and then you're free of VAT effectively. Um, so we we started off. Um, obviously saving the VAT at the time, which was 15 or 17 percent. And then um, we added on top of that the margins that we saved from the manufacturers, obviously kept a small profit for ourselves. Just through deals. Just through deals, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and the, the margins changed all the time. So you could save anywhere between you know 20 and 30 percent on top of the VAT, which was what, a big saving. What, how, what was the angle with that? How, how would you get the, how, what was your, your persuasion to the manufacturer to give you more of a discount what, what's their incentive to do that? well uh, effectively there were export sales so um, the car wasn't uh, really affecting any um, business in the UK so these were soldiers that were based overseas so either they would buy a car from a German dealer or they'd buy a car from them as an export so there was an incentive to uh, in the way that we had um, uh, explained to the manufacturers that they need to back and look after our military community so it's not a case of just give a guy a discount this is more a case of 
you know, these guys are serving their country, especially if 9-11 had, had just happened, um, they deserve a bigger discount than someone who works at Pizza Hut or, you know, uh, Boots. It's almost like your corporate social responsibility. Yeah. Uh, but also, um, better, better to buy a car from Nissan, for example, at little to no profit for Nissan than to buy, not buy from them at all and buy from a German manufacturer. Mm. That kind of, that, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. So we, we started off just selling tax free to military overseas. And then when we had a lot of troops coming back and injured and, you know, shot and killed and so on from Afghan and Iraq, um, most of those troops in actual fact came from the UK. They didn't come from Germany. So it seemed unfair for me uh, that um, we shouldn't be recognizing these troops here. So everyone that was based in the UK, why can't they get the savings that we've negotiated, albeit not the VAT part, but they should still get the savings that we uh, negotiate with the manufacturers to recognize and reward the, the military from that side of things. And that was a tough ask, to be fair. And um, But we eventually you know, got through with a number of manufacturers and we, we launched our UK program, as we call it, and we pioneered that whole entire program uh, in the UK uh, with a number of manufacturers. So we, we extended that to the UK military and not just the overseas military. Because if you're military, you're military. It doesn't matter where you're based, yeah, uh, in my view. And um, and that became extremely successful And uh, in 2006, 2007 when we did that. And um, I think 2008 started the recession worldwide, so to speak. And in 2010, it really hit home in the UK, to be fair. And then overnight, people weren't buying any part exchanges, you know, anything that was on order. Everyone was cancelling because they couldn't sell their cars. And um, and we had to uh, we had some tough times. That that was a challenge for us. Two thousand and ten, uh, it was a very very big challenge because overnight sales just dropped, the market dropped, everyone's values dropped, um, money was hard to get as a fund. Uh, if you were trying to get a funding on a car, banks clo closed every funding option off. You had to be the squeakiest clean person in the world if you were going to get the best rates. And um, so it was a real real difficult challenge. And um, I remember um, in 2010, it was it was really important because I think that was about the time when drawdown was announced from Germany. So within 10 years, all the troops will come out of Germany. And um, we'd already seen that that was going to happen. And we couldn't, as a business, when you, when you look at business and you try to understand where your direction is going to be, never put your eggs in one basket. And if we'd have only highlighted only on our tax-free business then uh, when these decisions were made to have drawdown, then, you know, our business would have dropped to nothing. So we had diversified earlier anyway into the UK. And in 2010, we, um, you know, came up with a new program that was for veterans. So whether you would served for three years or whether you served for 30 years, a year ago or 30 years ago, you are now available to the program that we've uh, uh, negotiated and created. Because I looked at it that, you could have been in the military for 20, 30 years, never been anywhere, you never done anything. And um, and uh, you could have you could have been in the military for two years and been to Afghan a couple of tours and come back, you know, and you don't want to be in the military any longer. That guy needs recognition. He could might only be 22, 23. And um, so I thought it doesn't matter the age of the person um, in the same way. It doesn't matter whether you're overseas or not as a, as a squaddy. So from from my perspective, it doesn't matter when you served and how long you served. If you have served, then you should be entitled to our scheme. And so we then opened it up to the uh, veterans market or ex-military market, or however you want to call it, and um, and created a new tagline for the business. Instead of just forces, cars direct, we uh, added the tagline, if you serve, you save, um, mm. on, on that. And that's that pretty much happened then. Did you think that? Up? Um, yeah, I think I... Th thought of something that was longer and we shortened it <laughs> so um well i was going to change it again so if you've served you save and um so we stuck with the, we stuck with that one to be fair <laughs> you know getting it and you try you do things in business you've always got to be cute and you've always got to be do you got to do something different and uh, and i'll tell you a story and my marketing person will will probably hate me for this but um um, and that's why I'm not, not in charge of marketing anymore. But uh, when we were in Germany, and uh, <laughs> when we were in Germany, um, you've got to try and create something that's a buzz or something that's a feel. And um, so I created this advert um, 
that was, um, uh, shall we say, risque at the time um, to try and say that uh, we, we couldn't take any more discount off. And if that gives you an impression of what we probably were putting in an advert. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, uh, and it got it got pulled from the uh, the, the uh, advertising standards agency. So we had to change that uh, tact on that side of things. But you've got to be different. You've got to you've got to try and uh, step out the box yeah. and, uh, and associate yourself differently. We're not the first to sell cars to squaddies. And we're not the only place you can buy a car from. You can buy a car from anywhere in the UK if you want. But what we do is something different and unique. And what we do is we try to um, offer um, a service by people who we employ who are ex-military who understand that that psyche, if that makes sense. So veterans is the is the biggest thing for us, really. It was a big game changer um, uh, in the UK because there's more veterans, as you know, going back you know, 40, 50, 60 years mm. that have never been entitled tax free or ever been aware of any of those programs. I, well, until we met at, um, yeah. at the 353 event. Yeah. Man, I'd never heard of you. I know. It's I'd, mental. And how many yeah. cars have you bought in that time? I you could have done something. Well, robbed. Robbed, <laughs> robbed, 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 robbed. <laughs> no, yeah. you know, but I'm thinking right there, mate, when you touched on the marketing, I... I I guess I'm right in saying that one of the biggest changes that's happened since your time in, in, the, in, in commerce is advertising and marketing. Yeah. It must be huge. Internet, the, internet as huge. well. Huge. Yeah. One of the things, uh, one of the things I, uh, yeah, cause one of the things I, I see now is with, um, with that side of it, from a business perspective, using social, let's just look at mm-hmm. social media, right? Yeah. Ignore email, ignore all the rest of it. Is that, it gives people who are starting a business, or th- even just thinking about starting a business, it gives them an opportunity. It can give them an opportunity to, without even setting anything up, or very little, yeah. hardly, you wouldn't even any capital, right? They can go online, they can set up their business online, right? Yeah. Give it a face, mm-hmm. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, flipping Reddit, mm-hmm. all of that, right? In much the same way as you get, as you get, people set up fake businesses and mm-hmm. scams you can set up a business online and you think i'm thinking about selling i don't know uh, tables with uh i'm thinking about selling tables with people's cat badges etched into the middle glass table with yeah. a, i'm giving some a business idea yeah? yeah glass table coffee table cat badges of units etched in the middle but i'm not sure if it's going to be any good at a, a business um, so I don't want to put the money into it. I might, oh, I might pay 30, 40 quid to get the company registered. Mm-hmm. But what you can do, like back in the day, you'd have to take a gamble, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Okay, a couple of friends go, I'll have one of them tables. These days, you can set it up online, mm-hmm. right? You can literally set up the business and go, this is what you can even get a computer generated image of the thing that you would produce and go, yeah. I'm selling these. Yeah. They're 100 quid a pop. Who wants one? Waiting time is, 56 days, for example, yeah, you know, from yeah. flash to bang. Without you even spending any money on the business, yeah. you know straight away within yeah. about a week, mate, yeah. whether that's going to, wh- you get a good indication of whether it's going to fly or not. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And the same way with the marketing. You know, back in the day, it was all outbound. You had to shove, you had to gamble on um, your outbound marketing, you had to gamble on magazine adverts, newspaper adverts, radio, TV. Um, if you If you got it right... If you got your advertising right, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I was, I mean, when you went to the Gulf, mm-hmm. I was in school, in primary school, <laughs> writing a pen pal, uh, uh, a letter, because we all had to do it, writing a letter to a British soldier in the Gulf. Like, right, a bluey, like, a bluey. A bluey. Yeah. And, we, and see who replied, and I, mm-hmm. I got a reply. It wasn't your It wasn't me, was it? <laughs> it wasn't you, mate. <laughs> do you want a car? <laughs> so, um, but, so, and if, but if you got it right back in those days, your mm-hmm. advertising, you get word of mouth. Yeah. You know, that, and that was the best you could ever get. Word yeah. of mouth. Got to force the cars about, force the cars about. No, man, it's got to be a lot easier. It's got to be so much easier. It's, um, uh, you're absolutely right. Cause when we, when we set up the business, one of the reasons why we did it is because, um, traditionally people walking into the showroom in Germany effectively was getting less and less and less. And the internet was just starting to become bigger. You're talking the end of the 2000s, uh, end, uh, end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. So internet was starting to get fast. And don't get me wrong. I still had, I had dial up when I had the office. It was still quite slow. And um, so you had to change. And, and that's the biggest thing about being in a business owner is you have to adapt 
and change to market conditions, market influences, and, and new ideas. And that doesn't mean every idea works, because trust me, I've done a lot of stuff, and I spent a lot of money on things that just fall flat on their face. And they might fall flat on their face there at that time, and if you redo it in a different time because of different technology or something else like that, then they can get even better and they can work better. So for me, in those days, it was pure and simple. Put an advert in a paper that everyone was reading and wait for the phone to ring. That's generally how we did it. Started getting faster and faster and the Internet started getting bigger and bigger. And as you mentioned, it's a lot of um, magazines and so on. And that's a lot of cost. Firstly, the design cost. Um, because you've got to outsource it in those days and then you've got to then get it to print and then get to print and it's got to go out to, to people and you've got to wait for all that to happen. Nowadays, you are absolutely correct. You can put a picture if you want, depending on the business, on Instagram and if someone follows it or someone does well, you can suddenly make a fortune on, on one good product. Now, that situation today is... Uh, exponentially massive compared to what it was in my day. So in my day, there's a smaller businesses and to set up, you got to have a lot of capital and generally to do that. So it was difficult, but you then had less competition nowadays because of the reasons you said it's easy to do that. You've got, you've got so much to actually swim in uh, and, uh, and to make yourself very, very different. It is, I'd say it's just as hard. And then you, then you had a game changer with, with Facebook and, uh, Instagram yeah, and as, as you yeah. said all all very very different yeah. we did Facebook advertising the first time about seven or eight years ago and it didn't work and um, and it was a lesson for us you know there wasn't you know, wasn't the, the, the fast enough speeds for people who might be in fast speeds in America but in the UK you're lucky if you get 10 meg you know so so a lot of things that you want to do uh, are all de de determined by the technology that's available at the time no one used mobile phones to search internet because you had to pay a lot of data it's all mobile phones now it's like 70 percent of people who you know search our websites all mobile phones mm. you know and we'll, we'll get over a million hits a year across our websites and uh, you know and identifying the right product the right picture the right colors in the right areas i mean it's it's a whole new world now when you when you set up on your own like i did the biggest challenge for me was to find people who were good at their jobs because um, I remember my partner, my business partner said to me, do you want to be stuck there just, you know, being happy with what you want to do, you know, doing a few cars a month and so on and so forth. I said, no, no, I want to, I want to do more. I want to do, always want to do more. And he said, you need to you need to employ more people. And I said, oh, God, I'm not going to get someone as good as me at, you know, doing the paperwork and so on. And um, But it was the best thing to do is to is to get more people to aid you in what you're doing. You can't always do it yourself. You can't have a whole day. You can't you're not always things. the best either, no matter what you no. think. No, and that, just... that, that happened over time. And so um, so I employed someone, and uh, and I remember <clears> it's, um, uh, Laura, um, Laura Search at the time. Uh, she came for an interview. First person was going to employ full-time. She comes to the interview, and uh, I thought, I know her. I thought, and this is in Lincoln. And it turned out I played football with her dad in Germany. And um, so she's been with us ever <laughs> since, 17 years now, and uh, that side of things. And then we've added more, added marketing, and then we've added this and that. And now, uh, you know, I walk in the office, we've got 20, 20 people all on the phone all at once, you know, and I think that's why you need a good team, because you can't do that yourself. You know, and the marketing team, I don't know how to do, you know, all the stuff that they do now. It's, it's wild, to be fair. All the admin, it, it's very different. And the sales team, I don't do any sales anymore. It's all strategic. And if you can direct yourself into the, the right areas, trust the team that you've got totally, not micromanage, which I had a you know a falling falling out for when I was uh, doing it a few, few years ago, probably seven or eight years ago. I, I wouldn't let go of that side of things. And um, But again, it's the best thing you do. And, and, that, and you've got to learn from that as an experience. And um, so for me, it was, um, there was a lot of hard lessons uh, to setting up a business from doing it on your own and bringing more people on learning different technologies and learning different different ideas and uh, and it's really important I think that if anyone that is out there and wants to set up a business don't give up don't get sidetracked and just want do one little thing you've got to be able to be diverse you've got to be able to do different things and um, and with the with the internet as you said earlier on today it does give opportunities to get ideas out you can even put your idea out on the internet and someone will give you advice on it yeah. uh, to be fair and um so we've um i've been luckily enough to be selected to to be a mentor for some uh, new military businesses set up from veterans and just to give my advice 
Um, you did that through Heropreneurs? Yes. Ah, amazing. Ah, well done. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. so, um, so uh, you know, it, 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 where possible, when you've got time to do that, then you can obviously uh, give someone a little bit of advice. Because over the years, people have sent me stuff and asked me, can I help them out and what do you think and so on. Normally, it's, will I invest, <laughs> to be fair. And um, and some ideas, to be uh, to be fair, have been really good. And, uh, and other ones haven't. And um, uh, But I think it's good for them to understand that, I was like them at one point, just a young lad, didn't know what to do, had an idea, did it work? And um, and, I, and I think that that's valuable for them to get some advice as well. I won't get it right all the time. I still get it wrong. You know, every day is a challenge. I think when you're, when you're doing something, you, um, you know, and you listen to your team, you might not agree with them. You'll then go a different direction and it doesn't work. And you've got to be humble enough to say, okay, I was wrong. I'll, I'll try it again different next time. Mm. Um, I've had a phrase since I've, um, uh, there's two phrases that I've uh, had with, with, since I started. One was given to me by someone else. If you can't make a sale, make a friend. And um, because, um, you know, not every, not all circumstances will go your way. And then if you look after that person, and that's the mantra that we do in our business, and if you really look after that person, for whatever reason, he can't wait for a car or whatever it is and doesn't want to change at that point, you know, he'll remember that. He'll remember that uh, situation, you know, come back over time. And uh, and the other thing for me as an owner, it would be every failure is a success. And um, because you, you can't go out there winning everything every time and being perfect every time. And every failure that happens, whether it's a failure of meeting or you've done the wrong strategy or you get peed off because you didn't get a contract or whatever it is, you've got to learn from all of those things and um, and make that fuel you for the next time. You know, and um, I get annoyed when I don't get things right. My office is not a happy place, and you know, when things don't go <laughs> well. And um, but you know what? It only lasts probably two or three minutes. It's not something that hangs over for days. <coughs> you know, I get annoyed when things don't happen, and that's fine. And then, okay, once I boxed it off here, it's gone. You know, I never really think about it again, and I just move on to the next uh, mm. next project. It's a really important lesson there, mate. Is that um, every failure is a lesson? Yeah, you know, every failure you, you learn something from it, and that's I'm, I'm, yeah, and people you get that shoved down your throat when you're a kid, right? Mm. You don't really, you don't really take any heed of it unless it, you actually experience it. And over, over my, I'm, I'm quite a, in my head, I'm quite an entrepreneurial <laughs> sort of thinker. And I've had a million, probably like yourself, and like mm. a lot of other people. Yeah. Over time, I've had a million different ideas. I think that'd be fucking brilliant. That would be brilliant, you know. And I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, gotta be a. 40 or 50 ideas upwards. And these can be ideas where you sit in there for five minutes, you know, mm -hmm. you haven't dug into yeah, the depth yeah, of yeah, the idea, yeah, right? Yeah. And probably most of those would never have worked. Yeah. But I've never pushed them far enough to try it. Uh, no, uh, up until recently, I've never right. pushed them far enough to try it. And only since I started recognizing myself uh, through, and through other things, a, a thing in my head is if you're going to say something, you fucking do it. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to say, if you say you're going to do something to, you, to your other people or to yourself, then go for it. If you think you've got a good idea or a good thing to do, then then go for it. And what happens is, especially with people, if it's an idea in an area without inexperience, for example, military person who's got an idea, involves starting a business, they haven't got a clue. I don't know how to set up a company. I don't know how to do marketing. I don't know how to do sales. I don't know how to get investment for, this, for, for the business because mm -hmm. it's not going to be cheap to set up, yeah. for example. You're never going to learn how to, any of those things until you go well i don't know any of that but let's go for it anyway yeah because the first thing first thing you do these days is you go, for that you go out and try and find information and again what have we got these days mm. the internet man you don't need university anymore no nope. unless you want paper paper, paper mm. to prove you learn you don't need university you don't need college you don't need apprenticeships for, to go and learn how to to learn a lot um knowledge you yeah. need it for practical hands-on experience mm -hmm. i'm not saying don't go to uni or college i'm just highlighting there's so yeah, much yeah, information yeah. out there now you've got everything you need to be able to get the information to get your first foot across the line mm -hmm. and start messing up yeah and start messing up yeah because i think now probably i i've i've, I've started two or three businesses along the way now and they, I would describe more as failures. Some more failures than others. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, and they, and they've largely, well, all of them have been down to not committing. 
right. not putting enough effort right. in, right. half arsing it, and you, you, and you you can't do that. No, um, and thinking something is going to grow itself, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. No. You know, you have to you have to invest in it. Yeah, and that's not just money. You have to invest time into it. Yeah, effort. You have to get the right people around you. And again, mm. with the people, again. You you don't you have it's it's fails and successes with the people. Oh God, man, the amount of people we've gone through that haven't worked because you know we we brought them on for a different reason. We didn't look at that, and um, you know, and it's cost you time, it's cost you money, yeah. and uh, but again, you can't learn that unless you um, have the experience to do that. And um, and if you've got an idea for something, and you're absolutely right, you know, you, you could have a hundred things whizzing around your head at once. And um, and I have a policy that. And it always comes at night for me when I'm lying in bed, you know, you know I put I the Netflix ex- off. I can explain that to you in a minute. All right, okay, cool. So uh, you get all these little ideas and they start running on, start running on. And I always think to me, if I've still got that idea in the morning, then I'll take it to the next stage. And mostly, they were all, half of them are gone. And yeah. um, um, and someone also gave me a lesson. He says, um, don't keep these ideas in your head. Write them down. Write a script. <laughs> write a write. Uh, uh, what if this and what if that and so on but not a full business plan you don't need to do it at that stage you just need to write the ideas and use people for those ideas tell your families do all those other things and get what other people think it doesn't mean to say that everyone's going to agree with what you say either because some people say that's too hard you can't do that and you hear all these people out there that say oh i could have done that as well and so on you know that's that's all bullshit you know if you think you've got a good idea and it passes your test then you don't need to convince yourself. You don't need other people to convince you. All you're getting, you're just, just massaging your ego if you want three other people to say, I think it's a great idea. Half the people don't know what they're talking about. Half the people are just saying it because oh, I'll just say that anyway. They don't really care. They don't know. So if you believe the idea is good and then you start putting down a plan of, of action of what you need to do and a business plan, uh, then try and see it through uh, because so many people talk themselves out of ideas. You know, you don't need other people to tell you it's crap. You know, you, you'll most people will do and talk them out themselves. So if you've got the mental fortitude and you've got the, the, the being driven and you've got the ideas and you've got this um, passion, you know, no one's ever going to teach you that. And you've then really got to move forward with that side of things. Mm. Now, there comes a realization at some point, if you've got all those things, that your just idea is crap, right? you know, yeah. but you won't know that until you've gone halfway over these hurdles. Exactly. You and have to get the knowledge yeah. to, to, to make a better appreciation of what you're doing. Then yeah. go, Fuck, what, what was I thinking? Because yeah. you'll learn a few things over the line. You'll learn what, um, uh, you'll, you'll learn some of the pitfalls of starting businesses, even if that one doesn't go your way. And there's plenty of experiences and, um, in the past that people can tell you about Richard Branson or, you know, Alan Sugar or whatever it is. There's hundreds of people out there that have failed with things, but then they've been successful, you know, and whether you're a footballer and you don't make it and suddenly you get a lucky break and it all works full. They've just had the passion in here that's always been able to drive them on, drive them on, drive them on. And, um, I think Blockbusters, uh, or no, Netflix. I think Netflix came with an idea to Blockbusters, you know, 20 years ago about streaming or whenever it was. I can't remember the exact time. Block, oh, no, I don't need that. It's never going to change. And, um, I oh, really, I don't know. 100%, 100% that uh, Netflix went to Blockbuster, uh, with streaming. But, because, but it was different to what they were doing. And it's not going to work. And obviously, we all know where Blockbuster are, and we all know where <laughs> Netflix are. <laughs> and um, and another one. Um, do, you know, do you know who invented the first digital camera? Uh, go on. Kodak. Mm. But how many digital Kodak cameras are there out there? Yeah, no, no. In my, my day in the Gulf, you didn't have the digital cameras. You had the no. windy, windy film that you had to take pictures of. They were only just coming in oh, when, I went, when right, I went right. to... Um, they were, no, sorry, the digital cameras were only just coming in when I went to... Golf two, right? Okay, yeah, golf two. Yeah, I had a I had a battery powered one that I robbed off my old. I didn't rob it; he gave it to me off my old man. It's massive camera, like a brick. <laughs> and he'd take a photo, <laughs> and it, it would he'd click the button, and he'd go <laughs> as it was focusing, and then it'd go click, and he go <laughs> <laughs> as he round to the next, as he round the film on the next one, you know, flipping neck. But uh, going back, mate. Yep. So you have your ideas at night. Yep. There's science behind that. Ah, yeah. Tell me, tell and me. I, so I used to have the same problem. When I when I used to get an idea, so I, I worked in the Middle East for four years, right? Right. And um, a lot of it was shift work, security, uh, security manager, site manager on, mm-hmm. on a rig. Um, so it's like, fuck's sake, mate! You don't talk to the Iraqi guards much, you know. Mm-hmm. And so you sat there on your own, like looking at the laptop, watching a film, whatever. Again, 
Nights were my nightmare. My first point, my first point of call if I got an idea was, yeah, 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 that'll work. I'd buy the domain. I'd go online oh. and I'd buy the domain. <laughs> Mate, I list about 30 <laughs> domains, right? But what used to happen is, I'd do yeah. that, then I'd get my head down, I'd wake up in the morning, obviously off shift, i get my head yeah. down, wake up in the morning, I'd be like, ah, what on earth was I thinking of that idea? Mm. Happen more often than not. This is why, it, at night, your brain is more creative more imaginative right. at night. Right. It's, it's an evolutional thing, right. evolutionary thing. In the morning, your brain is more logical. Ah. So at night, you get all those ideas, and that's why in the morning you wake up and go, what the hell? Like when you have a row with the missus, for yeah. example, yeah. you have an evening, you wake up in the morning and go, oh my God, I was, what was I thinking? I was being completely rational there, for example, <laughs> or I was as wrong as she was. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? That's why. Creative at night, logical in the morning. I yeah. end up doing exactly the same thing as you because of the money it's cost me, mate. Yeah. One of the main things that is, right, I get an idea, I write it down, I don't make any decision until yeah. the morning. Yeah. And if I wake up, this is real, if I wake up in the morning and it sounds good, mm -hmm. then I think it through and I'll go to a, a friend who I can trust and go, mate. And it's not the same, it depends what it is. I go, yeah. mate. This is what I'm thinking, what do you reckon? I think, oh, yeah, and see what they say. Yeah. Because they're people, this is the other thing. So, you got to try. I'm not going to say you, you have to surround yourself with good people. You've you got to bounce off people. Try and do that. Yeah. yeah try yeah. and, you want people who, okay, they may be knobs, you know, they may mm. not be the greatest person on the planet, but if they're going to give you an honest answer mm -hmm. and not say to you, yeah, mate, sounds mega, yeah. just because you're a mate, you don't want that. <laughs> no, you know, but you, you know who your honest mates are. 100%. Yeah, yeah, 100%. yeah. You, you, you know, yeah. And even though I get paranoid with that, you just, <laughs> mate, you just saying that's mega because, no, 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 mate, I'm, I'm telling you for shit. <laughs> yeah, not that I have mega. But that's when six months later they go, Jan, you're a shit. I told you shit. I told you shit. That's one of those with, um, yeah. it's one of those when you end up like, uh, I got divorced. I hope my kids don't listen to this. I got well, they don't listen to it now. But it was a right. future. I get divorced, and and when I get divorced, one of those. I mean, how many how many people, men and women, after they separate from a partner, get this off a friend? <sighs> Mate, I knew that person was no good for you. I yeah. knew it. Yeah. Well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> why didn't you tell me? All oh. years ago, they would listen. So your ex, so your ex wife owns half your domains. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got all, yeah, all the all the great ones, all the yeah, crap the ones. Yeah, ones, flipping heck. I had all sorts. I did my first website. Listen to this. I did my first website in 1997. Jesus, I was 16. Man. Wow. Yeah, <clears throat> I had to leave college because of it. <laughs> oh, one of those was it? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, the right geek. Oh yeah, 1997. It was uh, back then. I don't know if you read this. But Back in those days, in the late nineties, right? You to get a domain, so your website, your web address, mm. it was free. You could go on to a website called freeserve.net or right. freeserve. It's freeserve.net. Yeah, you go on there, and you could type in any domain. If that domain was free. All you had to do was click register, and it was put your name and address in. It was mm -hmm. yours. There was no money involved. Oh wow! No, I had so, so my nickname at school was Janus, right? I had JanusTheGreat.co.uk. <laughs> I had Flash Gordon. Dot co uk really flashgordon.com i had a basically i was i would sit there and think like wh what random cool ones are there and i'm 16 flash gordon i mean but now yeah man worth money i had yeah. loads of them i can't even remember the other ones right and i i did uh my first website was neath college sucks dot co uk <laughs> i mean my mate we, we did you get expelled from that did you <laughs> well it was in college <laughs> and i was doing a computer i was doing a level computing and we made that website um, while we were in the computing class, like turning the monitor away, you know, the big fuck off yeah. monitors, turning them away. And, uh, my mate who I did it with, his name's Sam, he's in the States now. And he, he had, his first website had been done before me. And his was, it was a, <laughs> it was a cat dealy fan page. Do you remember cat dealy? I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, he yeah. always loved it because it was the, he would say, this is the, it was the most popular cat dealy fan page on the internet and uh, you could you could search cat dealy fan pages because back then the internet was not as big as it was now no, definitely so there was not. probably only like 10 or 15 or 20 fan pages yeah. but they all had the stat counters at the bottom oh, God. so you could see on his much more much more people visit mine everyone else he had yeah. he had the, like the highest rated cat dealy fan page on the internet oh my god i know 16 year old flipping neck loving it god i, I remember the internet they used to have lycos was a search engine lycos yeah do you remember, do you remember that yeah yeah if there's a, oh no i've still got some i'm okay yeah. um yeah lycos so that was Neath College, but like, I did it all anonymously, and it was all right. I mean, the, the, the website, it was really basic. We, we, we took the piss out of, you know, you get 
like much like in the army, much like in any job, you get mm. a te- you get people you look and think you look like a bit like such and such or certain mannerisms, and you can take mm. the piss out of them. Yeah. If the teacher had like a dodgy haircut, and we used to say she looked like Darth Vader, as an example, so that's <laughs> what the website did: light-hearted poking fun at yeah. some of the lecturers, the ones we knew were good for it, yeah. right? But then there was a guest book. Do you remember guest books? Mm. Right. So on the websites back in those days, you could right. you could add on a thing called a guest book right and where someone can go and leave comments or reviews now you on each page on like a blog now you can leave you yeah. can leave comments can't you this is a guest book you click on the guest book link go there type in a name and you can type in a comment right and people were going in there students and oh. they were not being nice which no. is not nice yeah, yeah. No. of course i thought it was all anonymous because i didn't understand the internet that well you know, yeah <laughs> i'm not i haven't registered my real name <laughs> oh no i'm not, not put my name online but when i registered the website my fucking name is on there my yeah. address and all this Went in, I went into college. I was going in to tell him I was, I was going in to tell him I was, I think I was going in to tell him I was leaving. I can't remember what it was for, maybe, because I was going to join the military, because I, was, I wasn't doing well at the A levels. <laughs> and then they pulled, I got called into this back office and they said, is this your website? I got interrogated, uh, as much as you can do in college. And they said, you need to leave college. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> I was going anyway. Yeah, you sound like another Mark Zuckerberg. That's you know, well, yeah. <laughs> the social yeah. network. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's probably sucks, mate. That was the first one, flipping heck. And then I didn't touch, I didn't touch web design for years. And after that, so what did you do in the military then? I was um, power reg, right? The three power, yeah, yeah. three power. I joined in two thousand, right? Two thousand. So uh, five years after you left, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it makes me feel old, mate. I actually feel old when anyone says that now. It's like. Um, uh, you know, uh, people come in and say, when, when were you in? I'm like that. Oh, don't look that old, but, uh, God, it's a long time ago, you know, 1990, Jesus, you know, it's a long time. So you were in when all the redundancies came in then? The, f- the, the one before first, the last lot? First round, I think, 90s, yeah, yeah, 90s, yeah, 91, 92, there was, was a, there was a big drawdown of, uh, of redundancies. And, yeah. um, so, you know, well, I'm an 80s boy, aren't I? So I set, grew up in the 70s and 80s. So, um, so very different to growing up as a snowflake today. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nightmare today. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's a nightmare today. Um, uh, I, I was going to say something. Then. I can't remember what it was. Seventies and eighties. Trying to remind myself. No, no, I can't remember. No worries. Um So uh, that's what it was. With your. With the, your customs, customers, potential customers of the military, mm. what are the angles you try and take to target them these days? How, what are the angles in? Because it, it traditionally would have been, like you were saying earlier, a soldier mm. mag and that. Yeah. Are you going, are you trying to, do you try and target them? Do you know this answer? Because you're not the market anymore. No, yeah. no, 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 I do know it. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I hope I know it anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, traditional magazines, you know, they don't work anymore. And uh, everything people is, still do them. Yeah, they do. Mental. They do, but it's all digital. Yeah. It's all digital. So um, it's not as if you can, you know. There's hundreds of military bases across the UK, and you know, obviously, if you're retired, well, they live anywhere, don't they? And um, so you've got to be a lot cuter and have partnerships, which we have a lot of partnerships that we work really closely with, and um, you know, and, and rely on uh, collaborations effectively to do that. The internet's great, and Facebook's great. But, you know, if you really wanted to try and get into that whole market, you'd be spending, you know, probably a million, two million pounds a year to try and get to everything. You know, we don't have that as good as a business we have. I wouldn't spend two million pounds on marketing. Uh, we have done TV advert in the past, which went out in Yorkshire and it was pretty successful. And um, but again, it's very, very expensive to uh, replicate that through other regions. And uh, national press uh, we've done as well through Sunday, Sunday Mail and the, the Express and so on. Uh, done some PR with some PR agencies work for us in London uh, very successful uh, in getting a message out but with marketing it only hits that message at that point and uh, you have to constantly do marketing you know McDonald's is 50 60 years old you know, but you still see them on TV every day so the trick with marketing is that you have to constantly put that brand in front of someone <clears throat> now with the Instagram and the internet and all the influencers that are out there they're doing that for millions of different brands so to find your way in that space is very very expensive uh, but you've got to do it you've got to do some of those things to do that the traditional mags they're all dead now to be fair and um, or they're too expensive in print because no one else is paying the advertising revenue so you don't want to pay someone else's yeah. problems and um, so you, it's really really difficult and that's why we've got a, a team now that we have an in-house design team now as opposed to outsourcing it we have an in-house social media team 
an in-house partnership team and, and two business development managers that go around the UK meeting new possible uh, partners for collaboration. And that's that's really the key of, of how we do it. And that will change in two or three years' time. There will be a different way of mm. doing it. And uh, you've got to be – you can't be blinkered. One of the biggest things that um, – it was a lesson for me after you know doing well and you know having lots of sales and everything was perfect <coughs> is i took my foot off the gas natural when you get successful you think I'll take a little bit more time off play a bit more golf you know spend more uh, hobnobbing with whoever it needs to be and then suddenly you realize that you've lost business for whatever reason and it's hard to think well why did i lose that what's changed and um and for us it was um it was being complacent and being i would say um, not in tune with changes that were happening at that time digitally wise and um, and by the time you recognize a change it's already you've already lost it's like the tanker once you realize it's in the wrong course it takes a long way to come back again so um, we lost I would say um, you know some contracts or some um, you know customers where we we felt that we could do things a better way and we didn't we didn't change the way the outlook is so that's a lesson that never was never repeated and um, so we're making sure that we're always on the ball. We're always looking for the next thing. And we talk about the ideas. It's always new ideas, new projects, new things that are happening all the time. And um, you've got to give them all a go. And you can't think that um, it's just easy and it's all going to come to you. Nothing's, yeah. nothing's easy in business. That market research is huge, isn't it? Yep. Um, yep. Uh, and not just your own market, what you're in, but, but other markets that you use, like yep. like marketing yeah for example yeah the and stats that you'll get from someone like facebook or you know an online company that will give you statistics that you might know you know 30 percent of it because you know your own statistics your own business if you don't you're in your own statistics your own business then you shouldn't be in business really mm. and you're doing it by luck but when you get other statistics of other people's um uh the, the, the social media and how people use social media today you look at that and you think wow yeah, I didn't even know that. Is that really that much? Or is that really that how people think? And right down to the minus of details of how they flick on their phones and how they stop and how they do that, you think is not necessarily needed, but it's, some, it's a mind minefield of stuff. And you've got to try to understand that. And that's why you need a team of people around you that understand that a little bit more than me. I'm not on Facebook as a person I'm on LinkedIn, but I'm not on Facebook and um and we are we, but we we do use facebook as a business and it's mm. uh, it's amazing absolutely amazing mm. Mm. yeah mate um we're going to start wrapping it up but okay uh I enjoy that learn a lot mate no learned thank you lot. thank um, you is there anything um any little nuggets of advice you want to pass on for let's say for example people people set up a business mm -hmm. or um or anything else and and then let us know who, who we, how we find you. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I sort of echo what we've already sort of said. If you've got some ideas, you know, and they 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 last overnight for the next day, um, put them down. Do some research. You can't have enough information. You know, get as much information as possible. Information is today's cash, effectively, and uh, the more knowledge you've got about what it is you're trying to do and how to do it, um, that's going to give you in good stead to start something. Ask advice from as many people as you can you know and take all that information in you know and don't just ask people who are just going to glad hand you and give you the best uh you know to tell you what they want to hear so definitely um don't talk yourself out of it either give it a go you know and if it doesn't work then it's not because you didn't try your hardest to do something and give it your all it means that the idea probably was wrong but it, you don't don't fail because you haven't done enough um commitment to do that uh, if it's going to fail, it's going to fail because the idea was wrong, not for anything else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, just going back on the point, there's, because of all the information that's available, you can, you can, this is something I started doing recently, mm -hmm. you can war game, talk through in your head, okay, steps through from the conception of an idea, because, uh, and get all the, get almost all of the information you need to decide mm -hmm. whether it's feasible or not. A bar one key piece which mm -hmm. takes the time mm -hmm. and so you can you know let's take the glass table again for yeah. example yeah. glass table I want to put cap edges in it right okay you can sit there and think right how much is it to register a company mm -hmm. um, am I going to need insurance you know uh, uh, how much is a glass table going to cost mm -hmm. you know um, how many can buy at a time uh, how much is the engraving going to cost however mm -hmm. it's going to be done the glass mm -hmm. table and you can work out all those costs um 
which is all sort of that's that's definitive information you can get. Yeah, yeah you you can you can get most of, almost all of that online. Yeah, the one area you don't so you can get to a point where you go, I'm almost there with this. I I sort mm-hmm. of you you'll understand a lot more about yeah. what your potential business is going to be. Mm-hmm. And, and, but the one area you, you, was really hard to understand is that going back demand. Mm-hmm. It's great if you've got a p- product or a yeah. service. It's, you think, fucking hell, this, this, this would set, uh, this, this is, this will work. This, uh, this, mm-hmm. yeah, the cost on it, blah, 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 I can make money on this mm-hmm. if I can sell 10, yeah. you know, 10 a month or 10 a week. Or What's whatever. your break even plan? Is it exactly. five a month? Is it 10 a exactly. month? And that, d- that demand is where, yeah. again, you can use that social yeah. media. All the information's there. Yeah. The, the hardest part is putting your, Putting your foot yeah. across a line and just make a go of it. Yeah. You don't even have to tell anyone. Just putting your foot across a line mm-hmm. can be going, I've got an idea of something. Get online, do yeah. some research, get some information inside you. Because after that first bit of information, you gain it, mm-hmm. more questions will come out. You'll become more confident in your own idea mm-hmm. and you'll feel more comfortable talking mm-hmm. to people, getting for more information, talking to peer group and getting a better handle on it and mm-hmm. pushing it forward further. Yeah. And if it's shit, it doesn't matter. You've understood. You've understood why it's shit. You've gained yeah. information. So the next idea you get, because if you've had one, you'll have another. Yeah. The next idea you get, you already understand half the drama. Yeah. You already understand half of it. And it's going to be such an easier process moving towards it. Keep pushing it forward. You, you, yeah. Something will something will work as long as you keep pushing it forward. Most 100%. people that are successful, and I would say most people, um, if not all, you can get you can have a lucky idea and be just pure luck. Uh, but if you have those ideas and you keep forging new ones and you learn by your mistakes, they're the ones that will succeed and look much much further. You know, when we when we we sell cars, it's not just as I said, it's just about, about a car. It's about <coughs> you know we're saving a, a big chunk of discount up to thirty five percent, and we've saved over a hundred million pounds since we started. In savings, four uh, people, four our squaddies, yeah, and, yeah. and retired. So over twenty-two thousand cars, and um, and we wouldn't have done that if it was just a price and that's it. There's a lot more that goes involved in it, and you know, and being able to change and being able to be uh, diverse and being able to do multiple products, not just one car or two cars. And um, so it is important that you um, that you keep forging forward for that. And you were going to make mistakes. You're going to do you know, some errors over that time. But if you have those ideas in your head, as you just said, and you go through that, you've learned that experience and how to set up portions of business, it just didn't work either because that product wasn't good at that particular time. And then you forge forward that. Influencers, perfect, especially today's age. You mentioned it earlier on. You know, and if you've got someone who can uh, aid you uh, in getting your product, your idea out and so on, uh, that's absolutely important. And it's one of the reasons why we... Um, uh, work with Aunt Middleton, and um, you know we recognised that uh, we needed a bit more awareness about, excuse me, what we were as a brand, and uh, we approached him. Uh, he came to see us. He said the same thing. He was ten years old when I, you know he saw my pictures of the golf. <laughs> you know, he was just a young lad, um, but he's modern and he's cool and he's all over the TV doing lots of different things. And he, we felt he was a right ambassador for us as a business. And the guy who's ninety five years old who buys a car from us doesn't know who Aunt Middleton is, but for us, you know, and the help that he's given us over the past few years with his followers and so on. Because even if one of his followers isn't in the military, they might know someone who's someone is in the military. Everyone knows someone who's been in the military or knows someone for the military. So influencers are a perf- <coughs> perfect opportunity for um, <coughs> helping in business, no question. Absolutely. How do people find uh, Forces Cars Direct? Um, well, we have a website, um, which is forcescarsdirect.com. And, um, and all the information about what we do, how we work, uh, we're very open. All our prices are on there. All our monthly payments are on there. We don't ask people to give us inquiries and then we'll get back to them with a price. We're very open about what we do. And when they're ready to do something, uh, whether you're a veteran or a serving person, MOD, uh, you can just give us a call and we'll help you, uh, in whatever way we can. Awesome, mate. Brilliant. Uh, just want to say, Heropreneurs, mate, commendable being a mentor for them. It's, uh, it's time, your time and effort for nothing yep. to people, which is awesome. Uh, and it's been an absolute pleasure. No, you're welcome. Mate. It's been a pleasure for me as well. Cool. Cheers, Steve. Thanks, you. Awesome. Take care, mate.